Good evening. <laughs> we can do better than that. Good evening. All right. Welcome uh, to Family Matters and kind of a special night tonight. We have guests with us from Be Broken tonight, and I want to introduce them to you. This is Dan. If you were here uh, Sunday uh, for service, you might have noticed Dan was in that video that we saw. So we're excited to have Dan with us tonight. His wife, Julie, is here with them. And this is Melanie. And she, so they are going to be sharing with us tonight. They're going to be here to help answer questions as we get to that time. They've got resources out in the foyer that they're going to talk about, that they'll be around afterwards to be able to connect you with. Our goal tonight is just to really be able, as we continue this conversation, uh, that we, we realize Sunday morning uh, it, it's important for us as, as believers, as families, as the church, to know how to address this, this issue that is so prevalent in our culture. And so I am so excited that we have a ministry right here in the San Antonio area that is ready to partner not only with us as a church, but with you as an individual, as a family, as a couple, uh, to help you navigate such a, uh, such a crazy world that has so many opportunities to, to reach up and just uh, grab us and, and lead us uh, down paths that, that lead to destruction. So to know we've got a resource like that that will come alongside us and give us great biblical gospel-centered tools uh, to find freedom and hope and healing and all of those things. So we're excited tonight uh, to be able to, to connect you guys uh, with Be Broken and, and just see how the Lord wants to use that. So let me pray for us, and I'm going to get out of the way. And Dan, I'm going to give it to you, okay? All right. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this opportunity that we have as a church to, uh, to just think rightly about this topic of sexual purity and, and, this, and, and to understand addiction and the dangers of it, but also even more to, fight, to realize that in the gospel there is freedom, that chains can be broken, that there can be healing, that there is hope. And so, God, tonight, may we lean in uh, to what you want to say to us tonight. God, may tonight be a night where where there is freedom uh, that uh, is found, where families are able to get tools they need uh, to, to lead their homes well uh, in, in, this, in this area. So we thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for Dan and Julie and Melanie being with us tonight. Uh, and God, would you just use them in a special way? In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you guys so much. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Can you all hear me? The one thing that the, uh, my allergies have been trying to do all day is to steal my voice. So hopefully for the next hour and 20 minutes, I'm good. And then after that, I can stop talking for a while and everybody will be happier. All right? Well, I appreciate Daniel's introduction. Uh, my name is Dan Wapshaw. I'm the director of men's ministries at Be Broken Ministries. Um, my wife, Julie, and I have been through a journey of our own, and you heard a little bit about that in the video, if you saw that in, the, in church. Uh, and I will confess, that's the first time my video has been played like that, and then I had to follow it up. It's kind of intimidating, all right? Uh, but it's pretty cool. At age 12, I was exposed to pornography for the first time. Over the course of the next 30 years, Pornography and everything that comes with it became my medication for stress, for uh, thinking I was worthless, being bullied, all those kind of things. And when I met my wife, that was fully ingrained as an addiction for me at age 24. Because it, it, began, it began at age 12 as a, a shocking, traumatic moment for a 12-year-old kid who had no idea what his eyes had just seen and what had happened to him spiritually, emotionally, and physically. That's a traumatic event for a child because there's no 12-year-old boy or girl who's ready for what happens when that happens. And we're going to talk a little bit about how parents and even grandparents can play a role in making a difference in that in today's culture. So part of what, I want to get to the material first, but here's what I can tell you about what pornography and everything that comes with it 
including the strip clubs I went to, using my police badge to get into for free, not paying a cover charge, because strip clubs love having cops in there because it makes them feel safer, okay? But when I was, what we call D-Day came about and Julie discovered everything I had been doing, including a two year long online relationship with another woman, our lives exploded. And in the midst of that, I became suicidal. Now I was a guy who grew up going to church but at 18, Dan wanted him to go his own way. But when we got met, when we met and we got married, we went back to church. But all those years in church, I heard about Jesus, but I did not know him. So when all this trauma and tragedy hit our marriage, I had no real place to go but inward, which is where the problem existed in the first place, right? There's a saying that I don't know if I coined it, but I said it, is a problem cannot be solved at the same level of thinking in which it was created. I was trying to fix the problem I had that was within me from within me. And it drove me to suicide attempt. But God in his sovereignty said, nope, I've got plans for you. Now I didn't realize that for (laughs) a long time but he did. So to really shorten the rest of this and get to the heart of the matter for you all tonight is in 2003, I met Jesus, the Jesus I never knew before that day. And I didn't accept or invite, I begged him into my life because I couldn't do what I was doing anymore and it was destroying our family because we also had three girls at home Blonde, redhead, and a brunette. Yes, we have many people go, what? They're all ours. I was, had red hair when I was young. <laughs> I also had blonde hair when I was young. My dad, turns out, had red hair, although I never saw it on him. Uh, and my wife has naturally dark hair. So, yes, it's very interesting. But as I came to true faith then, and we began to walk this journey to freedom together, It was hard, and I did it kicking and screaming. I think Garrett said that, if I'm not mistaken, on Sunday. I fought my way out kicking and screaming because I didn't necessarily want to, honestly, because the addiction became a crutch, a place to go that I knew, and it wasn't as scary as being free. Freedom meant I had to own my life, take responsibility for my journey, and not let some insufficient addiction fill the void that it was never meant to, nor could it ever. And when I met Jesus, I realized he was the only one who was going to fill that void. Seven years later, it took us seven years, I was free. And then I heard God call me into ministry And I'll save you the rest of the story because we don't have time. But all those years later, here I stand. Not because I'm worthy of standing here, but because we have a God who says, I am worthy for you, and I'm just going to ask you to go serve me. And that's why we sit here today. By the grace of God and nothing else. (laughs) Not because I am anybody special. So as we take a look at this topic, you've heard from our story what it can cost you. Because as we begin to look at this, there is a statement that is very true. Lust is never satisfied. Just like a fire, it will burn until there's no more fuel or you put it out. Lust, it never has enough. It will just keep drawing a man or a woman because more and more women are getting, getting entangled in this too. You heard the statistics. That number is climbing steadily every year. And unfortunately, they're starting to catch the men. Right? 
So, as we take a look at the term, we could, if you even wanted to, you could forget about the word sexual for now. But as we minister to men, what we're really looking at is integrity. Because that's what's been lost in an addiction. Integrity means a sense of wholeness. Right? If you look at the word shalom in Scripture, where it says peace, and you go deeper into the Hebrew, that means a sense of wholeness as it's meant to be. So when Jesus is called the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Shalom, what it's saying is he's meant to be the Prince of Wholeness as you and I are meant to be. Because the mission of Be Broken is to take men, women, and families from sexual brokenness to wholeness in Christ and equip others to do the same. Because this ministry at its basic core biblical perspective is discipleship. And right standing next to it is stewardship. And I'll unpack that a little more as we go. All right? So what we're going to do now is give you a brief overview of some of the God's design for sexuality and integrity, and then we're going to give you some resources. So by the time we're done, if you're thinking, I know somebody that needs some help, or whoever, you'll know at least your next step to take to guide somebody, all right? So what we're going to cover in the next little bit are these topics. Uh, we don't have time to go deep into them because this would, if we went deep into all these, we'd be here till about midnight, and I don't think anybody wants to be here quite that late, right? What, Daniel, you told me I had three hours? Okay. <laughs> Kidding. All right. So, uh, but what we're going to talk about is in these areas is what is necessary to live a life of sexual integrity. Uh, and Melanie, and we've got resources out table we can go over with you. If there's resources out there for men, for women, for parents, and for kids, for teens. Okay, we have all those available through our ministry. So let's take a look at these quickly. What is sexual integrity? We're going to explain that a little. Identity and how this plays a part in what sexual brokenness and pornography does to our identity. The part shame plays. What's God's design for sex? Do you think that matters? <laughs> I, I do now. I get it, right? Sex was God's idea. He created it for us, and it's beautiful. It's always beautiful. What corrupts it is what it's attached to, right? Right? The four pillars of purity, we'll unpack those, and a little bit about making amends, because making amends is a big deal. It could be a big deal if it's done poorly, but it can be incredibly powerful if it's done right. Okay? Make sense? So what does the term integrity mean? It means wholeness throughout. And historically, this is actually a nautical term. Uh, believe it or not, referring to the hull of a boat or a ship. So if a ship is considered to have integrity... It contains no holes, any other damage that would render it uh, incapable of floating or doing its normal function. So another way to really to um, define this is who you are when who you are is in alignment with every part of your life. In other words, you're not living a divided life. You're the same person at work, at home, and asleep. That's integrity. That's what it looks like. See, God has made us in his image in order that we might function as his representatives here in this beautiful creation called earth. And in particular for most of us, the United States of America. So in the, in the, in the meaning of operating with wholeness throughout in our thoughts and actions, Sexual integrity means that we are functioning this way as it pertains to the stewardship of our bodies, whether male or female. And here's where I'm going to touch on stewardship, right? We've all heard the talks of stewardship with our money, our time, our gifts, our talents, our relationships, our children, our marriages. But guess what else that's all part of that same family unit that is a creation of God. 
I said it a few minutes ago. It's our sexuality. It's a gift of God. So God's design and intentions is for us to steward that gift well. As he designs and as he has created to be stewarded. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's his idea. It's a beautiful thing. As a matter of fact, if we go all the way back to the garden, what's one of the first things after Eve was made from man that God said to Adam and Eve to do? Be fruitful and multiply. If we just cut to the chase, he's saying, go express your sexuality and the beautiful bonds of marriage and create more of you. When that wily old serpent came in and Eve bought the lie and Adam didn't step in to protect him, that beautiful gift was broken with the rest of creation. And that's part of what Christ went to the cross to redeem every single part of you and me, including our sexuality. That's a beautiful picture. I don't know about you, but for the longest time, I never thought about my sexuality being part of what Jesus went to the cross to redeem. That's pretty profound. That's enough to bring me to my knees at times. And by the way, there's a resource here. We don't have this book with us, but Our Bodies Tell God's Story by Christopher West. It's a great book to read to pick up as a resource. It's out there on the web. So let's take a look at the identity. Identity is, is, is truly the essence of who you are and an understanding of the meaning of your existence. So there's, as you can see, there's three elements here we're going to unpack a little bit. So to know your identity, we must know these things. We must know, you must know who you are. So the question I would ask, not necessarily need to be answered, but do you have a self-awareness regarding your mind, your body, and your spirit? Are you aware of the condition of all three of those at any time in your day? Because all three of those influence and impact how you feel, think, and behave. It is by design, it is not possible for us to say, I'm okay or I'm well, even if you're spiritually well and physically well, but emotionally, you're unhealthy. Guess what? You are not okay. All three of those interact with one another. I can, I can promise you, if you stop and think about it, <clears throat> pardon me, if there's a day that you're hyper-stressed, your body is telling you about it someplace. Whether it's a headache, an upset stomach, muscles in your shoulders that do this, and your wife walks up behind you and says, you a little tense today? Your body's talking to you. Why? Because they're all tied together by design. God meant it to be that way. So if we choose to ignore one part of our being, we're harming it all. And what is, can you even think of anything in your life that's more emotionally charged, physically connected, and body, mind, soul, and spirit than our sexuality, especially between a husband and wife. I don't think there is one. Is there any other relationship where God said the two shall become one? There isn't another one. And it's meant to be absolutely beautiful. Does that mean there isn't going to be difficulties? Of course not. We're whole and we're redeemed and transformed, but we're still two sinful human beings who don't always agree on things. Not to mention the fact she's an incredible extrovert, has never met a stranger, and I'm the guy that would rather be sit over there in a corner and watch everything. <laughs> All right? Opposites attract. So whose you are? Do you understand the gospel and how God has 
creation of you is in his image. Not only do we represent him with the gospel, we resemble and are his ambassadors physically. To be the light to the world, what does that mean? As his children, we walk out into the world and we carry his light with us. That's the part of the image. We have the joy to present to the world around us. And why you exist. Do you know your purpose to glorify God and reflect him to the world around you? Ephesians 2.10 speaks to that. We're created for good works for us to do. God prepared good works to do for each of you in advance. We are his workmanship. The original language there is the word, <clears throat> I believe it's a Greek word, poema, which is poem. So if you, if, as I understand, if you read that literally, you are God's poem. One of a kind that he created and for you to do good works that he already has for you to do. Yes, we all have a calling with what we call the Great Commission. But I now know every human being who steps into the family of Christ has a purpose that is unique to you given by God. And I believe that to the depths of my soul because I've lived it out. Right? And we don't have time to unpack purpose. That's another two-hour seminar. Right? But we've got an enemy. And if there's not a clear presentation of what the gospel is to me, it's John 10.10. 10. The enemy came what? To steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come to give you life and life to the full or abundant. Whichever translation you look at, it changes. So when our identity is attacked, and especially in the area of sexual brokenness in our life, it's not just our identity that's being attacked, and it is, but it's Christ in us that's also under fire. All we have to do is look at the example of Paul on the Damascus Road. Paul was standing there watching Christians be killed, in particular the one that stands out is Stephen. And when Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, he didn't say, why are you persecuting my disciples? He said, why are you persecuting me? That's why also I believe the scripture says that when you sin sexually, you're sinning against your own body, that that's pointed out. Why? Because our bodies carry the very image of God within him. And as a Christian, his spirit dwells in us. Stewardship comes to mind again, all right? So we were made to bear God's image, not build our own. See, I was a skilled image builder. So many men I meet with are skilled image builders because they're living a life that they want the people and the public to know about. But this other guy that I called nighttime me was the one that my wife knew nothing about until 19 years of marriage, when that guy was found out. The image I built was a public servant in a small town who wore a uniform practically 24 hours a day. And if you'd asked anybody in our small town about me, all you would have heard was kindness. And this guy's a hero in our community, but they didn't know about him. I haven't ever met a man who's not building an image that comes to our ministry. We're not meant to live that way. We're meant to live in the image of God and in freedom, right? Let's keep moving. Shame. Now, you're going to look at that and say, positive shame? How can shame be positive? I'll be honest with you. I wrestle with that term. But I'm going to shape it this way. I used to think that guilt was bad, feeling guilty. But if we look at Scripture, there is a good kind of guilt. There's, but there is two kinds of guilt. One guilt is, I'm sorry I got caught. That's worldly guilt that lives, leads to death. 
then there's godly guilt that leads to repentance. And in the frame of positive shame, that's what we're talking about. I was ashamed and still am of the things that I did and said and looked at and all the rest of it. But that didn't attack my identity. See, shame that comes from our enemy says, you are a mistake. Godly guilt says I made a mistake. Big difference, would you agree? Because the shame is attacking your core identity of who you are in Christ. And then it leads to I'm worthless, I'm unlovable, I'm no good. You can't imagine the things I've heard men tell me about how they see themselves. Especially the one soldier whose father tried to drown him twice before he was 10 years old. Do you think there's a little trauma in that little boy's life? And when that stuff is never dealt with, they carry that into their adulthood and then they start living out those fears and they wind up coming to us. All right? So the negative shame I've just explained, it sounds a lot like you're stupid, you'll never amount to anything, you're a mistake, you should have never been born, you will never measure up, you might as well just give up. You're ugly and you have nothing that would cause anyone to want you. If I took a poll with everybody's eyes shut and just asked people to raise their hands, I can just about promise you at least 30% of the people sitting in this room, one of those shame lies is something they've experienced or felt in their life and probably in their childhood. It's awful quiet in here. Am I that scary? Right? Yes, this is, this is not the pick-me-up topic of the day all the time, right? Uh, I have to remind myself, I have discussions about these kind of topics every day that the average person would walk in on all those conversations, would turn around and walk right back out of the room like that, okay? So how do we combat negative shame then? It's very simple. What's the one, one unfallible source of truth? The Bible. God's word. That's where we go to fight this. The shame lies that the world, the flesh, and the devil may have been dumping into your life, a man's life, since they were a child. There's a song, one of the lyrics in it, I love it. It's Jericho is the name of the song uh, by Andrew Ripp. He's got a short little phrase in that song, and it says, terrify the lies with truth. That's what we're going to do here. That's how part of the way we help men, as far as what I work, men find their way out. Identify the core shame lies, and we take them on with the truth of God's word. That's where the freedom comes. What sets us free? The truth, right? It's the truth that sets us free. The, the Galatians chapter 5 verse it is, says it is for freedom that Christ set us free. So don't pick up that yoke of slavery and put it back on, right? What a beautiful thing. So the primary weapon is God's truth. We declare it that we are beloved children of the creator of heaven and earth. We're a friend of Christ through God. Our lives were worth Jesus going to the cross. That's your value, my friends. Your worth and your value is not defined by your mistakes and bad choices. Your identity is defined by one source, God the Father. Grace, here's what Psalm 103.10 says about grace as a primary weapon. He, God, does not treat us as our sins deserve, nor repay us according to our iniquity, even in our brokenness. An ongoing struggle with sin. God loves us and shows us compassion as we work out our salvation every single day. It's grace that sets us free. Grace is a powerful tool in the hands of a mighty God. I used to look at, I'm saved by grace through faith, and I used to focus on faith, which is, to say it mildly, is important. 
But what does it say in that statement that sets us free? Grace. By grace, through the conduit of faith, we come to salvation. Grace steps into your life and says, shame, the voice of, this, of the enemy, you have no place in this man or woman's life anymore. Truth comes through grace so that you can find freedom and discover God's plan for your life. So we are going to move on to God's design for sex. The gospel metaphor, Christ in the church, is a beautiful, beautiful picture of what marriage is meant to be. So as we pursue a life of greater integrity, it is important to understand what God's design for sex and sexuality is. So marriage is a metaphor or a picture of the ultimate oneness relationship. Christ and the church is about us to steward our sexuality well to honor Christ and point others to him. We enter a covenant relationship with Christ at salvation. He becomes the bridegroom, his church, you and I become the bride. It's beautiful. At that moment, then, also as husband and wife come together as one, and they become intimate, they become one body, mind, soul, and spirit. Also, what comes to play in the life of a Christian is the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. That's an intimate, very personal connection between our Savior and you and I. There's new life created there. The Holy Spirit enters our lives and we are born anew. Man and woman come together in sexual intimacy, and what do we do? The most that are fortunate can create new life that also bears the image of their Creator. And then as we heard from Genesis in the garden, be fruitful, multiply. God gives us the command to go multiply ourselves and make more disciples. And when that sexual integrity bond of a marriage is damaged, all of that I just laid out for you is interfered with and broken. So when we come back to redemption, God can restore all that, and he does. Now, we're going to talk about how some of this affects us as parents because there is vital information here relates to this as we are parents, and now some of us are gray-haired grandparents, all right? So the four pillars of purity. These are the four pillars that we lay out and unpack in our three-day men's intensive weekends, and we do a number of them throughout the year. We hold these three-day intensives in, here in Texas, in Florida, Georgia, Pennsylvania right now, those four states. The first thing is we just have to profess the struggle. In other words, we need to confess. Here's something that's true about addiction. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety. It's connection. I'll say that again. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. Because any, any, any addiction, whether it's sexual addiction, alcohol, drugs, gambling, whatever it is, it gets its beginning and in, in grip in a person in isolation. It causes them to withdraw from everybody around them, and then it grows because it can grow un, unimpeded because the individual's pulled back. In the Christian community, when we take our pain and our brokenness and bring it out into that light of Christ, like a body like this, and that body gets around that broken person or family and says, we're going to be Christ's light to you. We are going to help you walk, and we're going to help you heal. God works powerfully through that. And you know how I know? That's exactly what happened to us. We stepped into church that I can feel the heart of here, just like I had, we had in that church 
back in this small town in Minnesota. Said, we love you. We don't care how broken you are, what kind of mess you're bringing in. Come on in and we're going to help you walk through this. And they were truly a healing church. And that's how the body came to fight for us. And it will do the same for you. It can. Understanding yourself, your struggles, and your triggers. I don't have time to, to explain triggers, but if you have questions, please feel free to answer. You're going to have time to do it. We'll show you how. Triggers are emotional pain points in a man's life, could be in a woman's life, that typically go back to childhood where when that pain point is poked, all that that individual, that little kid wants in that moment is comfort. That's why when that child's wound is poked, if they were abused as a kid, they discover pornography as their comfort, as I did. When that same emotional pain is triggered, they go right back to the same source for comfort, even if they know they're going to feel like garbage afterwards because it's the only thing they know. And as was talked about in, your, in Jason and, and Garrett's message, was the neural pathways in our brain that develop over time. The brain just responds to the emotion and then we act. Because what happens in, a, in, an, in an addicted mind is all the logic senses in the front of your brain, when those emotional fight, flight and fear, all that kicks in, all the emotional states back here, just overrun this and shut it down. And even though your brain goes, this is not a good idea, all the emotion back here says, be quiet, I want to hear from you right now. I just want comfort. We hear this kind of a story from men who say, I, I, it's like I came to my consciousness 15 or 20 minutes into that activity and, and asked myself, how did I even get here? Because that's what the mind has been shaped, literally shaped to do under those stressors. And it's learning to abandon those old neural pathways in part to create new ones. And that doesn't happen in two weeks. <laughs> for some, that's 30 days. For some, it's 90. It just depends. Relating with God. There is no better joy than every one of my days to wake up, open God's word, and spend 20 to 30 minutes in it myself. Uh, and then Julie and I spend another 30 minutes to 45 minutes, depending upon the morning, in the Word together. Now, I didn't do that my whole life. <laughs> I didn't even do that in the first five or eight years in my walk with the Lord. But I do now. The Word of God is alive. It speaks to us every single day. Just picture the Word of God like this. It's your Heavenly Father looks at you and says, hey, have a seat. Let's have a conversation. I got some things I want to tell you this morning. Just open that book. That's, that's what I want to tell you today. That's what the Bible is. It is the living word of God. And he's a heavenly father who says, I know the pain you're in. I know. I know. So come to me and let's talk, right? The great comforter. Engage others, community. I've talked a little bit about that already. We need that human connection. One of the things that's vital to somebody going through some recovery work is what we call the three-legged stool. All right. Is there's three pieces to a man or woman's recovery from addiction, sexual addiction. There's small group, a support group, counseling, and an intensive those three things, when they are put together and somebody chooses to use all three, the likelihood of them walking out free and whole, and if it's a marriage, the likelihood of that marriage walking out redeemed, restored, and transformed and whole increases significantly. But it takes both people willing to do that work. That's why a community is so important. We can't fight and do, we're not meant to do life alone. No matter how good life is, we're not meant to walk through it alone. 
One of the other things that happened in the garden is God saw Adam standing there and said, all of it, oh, this is good. And he went, eh, that's not good that he's by himself. What is he saying? My creation is not meant to live alone. Because God himself is not, while he's the, the unique mystery of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, three, yet one. The perfect holy community, if we're created in his image, we're also not meant to live alone, to do life alone. All right? Does that make sense? All right. We're getting close to the end, kids, at least for this part. Making amends. It's simply more than saying, I'm sorry. Because I said I'm sorry for a lot of things, but really what I was sorry for is that I got caught. Right? Saying I'm sorry, is it good to say I'm sorry? Sure it is. Of course it is. We need to apologize for what we do that's in error, that's in sin. But I'll tell you what, simply repenting, and I'm a, if I'm out of line, there's some pastor here who can fix me. So if there's any heresy that comes out there, they can fix it, okay? Repenting alone does not affect a sustaining change in life. I repented a hundred times during my recovery, but I still went back to what I was doing. What has to happen is a heart change. There's got to be decisions that are made instead of just words. I tell every husband, expect your wife not to believe a word you say for the next five years. And the only way you're going to build that trust back up is by what you do. That's it. That's the only way it's going to come back. And eventually, your words will begin to matter again. And your I'm sorry will begin to have some foundation under it again. We have to face the consequences. In other words, we have to own it. As a, as a man, I had to own my mistakes, my bad choices. I had to own making the changes in my life to help my bolster my recovery, to grow, to be free. In other words, uh, I got rid of the internet in our house for a while, ditch cable TV. I had to stop seeing and spending time with certain friends in my life. I just couldn't be with them anymore. I love these people, something I worked with and I would have died for, but I couldn't go socialize with them because they were toxic to my recovery and to my marriage. But it's up to the, it's up to the man in this situation to own that. It's not up to him to expect his wife to make that plan for him. It's up to the guy to own that. Do what we can, do the right thing as a husband or a man in recovery, but leave the outcomes to God. And here's one of the tough ones that we talk to a lot of men about. They're healing and they're growing, but their wife is so hurt, she just can't move on. going to have to leave that to God. Or we hear from wives who said, my husband went through your workshop and he was great for six months. And I don't know what happened, but he's right back to where he was. All she can do, and we're going to talk about that, is do what she needs to do to get healing and help for herself. Rebuild and restore her relationship with the Lord if it's been hurt. Pray for that husband and leave the results to God. That's hard. That's really, really hard. But it's the truth, unfortunately. All right? Are you ready to go walk out of here and do handstands yet? So what are some next steps? If you're a man or woman sitting in here tonight, or you know somebody, a good friend, maybe a son, a grandson. I hear from parents all the time about their 21-year-old son who's up to his neck in it. I hear from the wives who say, 
what do I do to help my husband? I would say 40% of the calls I get where I wind up visiting with a man, 40% of those come from the wife first. So what needs to be confessed? It's no longer, it's, it's time for the secrets to come out into the light. Now, when you confess, you need to be wise about who you confess that to, right? You can't just confess this kind of stuff to anybody. It's got to be somebody you know and trust is going to honor your confession. A good, close friend, your pastor, a counselor, right? What needs to be removed? I talked about some of it. Maybe you need to ditch the internet. I, I've got to change new friends. I know of a police officer who came through our workshop. He was five years from retiring with his full pension. His work environment was so toxic for his recovery. He said, I can't do this anymore. If I'm going to remain sober and free and healthy and keep my marriage together, I have to quit. And five years short of a full pension, he walked away from his law enforcement career and started something else because that was what had to go for him. What do you have to remove? What needs to be added? What protections need to come into your home? And by the way, things like filtering software on your computer, books and resources to educate yourself so that you can educate your children. Maybe a workshop, an intensive for this person. If you're a hurting wife, there are places you can go to get help and healing for your journey too, regardless of what a husband chooses to do. And who needs to be involved? Counselor, pastor, you have what I would call a faithful friend. A faithful friend is who, when things are going rough, and if I can dare use a military metaphor in here, well, the, when the bullets are flying, they will run through the bullets to get to you. Okay? We all need a Nathan in our life. Nathan who came to King David. We all need one of those. I tell every man, if you don't have one, find one, and then for the next man, become one, right? So what are some next steps? I'm going to give you a few resources here that you can take a look at. Um, Gateway to Freedom is our three-day workshop. If you go to bebroken.org slash men, that's where you'll find this information. That is a three-day intensive. It starts... 10.30 on a Friday morning, and it goes till noon on Sunday. Uh, and it's an intensive. It's staffed by either myself or Jonathan, our ministry founder, as the facilitators and teachers for the large group. And then we have experienced licensed counselors who fill the roles for small group facilitators and work with a group of eight or less men for three days. Uh, what they get during those three days in a level of counseling is equivalent to six to eight months outside of that setting of counseling. So it's jammed full of information. Uh, Grace-based recovery online study. That's done for eight weeks. You can sign up and do that online. It's, it's based and done through the Grace-based recovery book that we, I believe we have some out there, right, Bell? Uh, 40 Days of Purity is an online course. That is a course that is drip-fed every morning for 40 days to an inbox for men. So you can take that course at your own pace, but it gets sent out every morning uh, for 40 straight days. There's a small fee for that uh, course. I think it's $37, but you have lifetime access to the material. We have one guy that he sent us an email. He'd gone through this course 40 times <laughs> of his own volition. And he said every time he went through, he picked up something new. And then the last one is a personal ministry consultation. That's a one long one hour long conversation with me. And I do 40 to 50 of those a year where men will sign up, have a consultation. They'll share their story with me, where they're at, and I'll give them an honest response of what, it, what I believe their next one to three steps are given their situation and how urgent things are. Uh, and then... One of the things I love about our men's program and our wives' program as well is our guys don't come for just three days. We give them a hug and say good luck. 
We've got a full aftercare program for the men, that, uh, for the men and there's one there for the women as long as they want to stay connected. We have support for that man for as long as this ministry exists or he's alive. He'll never have to walk that journey alone again, ever. But like anything, you can put the greatest tools in the world in front of somebody. They got to choose to pick them up and use them. And we can't force people to do that, right? So with that, I have a slide here that I need to put before you. If you have a question, you can join in uh, scanning a QR code and join the web at that address or text send FB281 and your message to 22333. That will come in anonymously, anonymously easier for me to say. Um, Daniel is receiving those. He's, I think he's probably already got a few from earlier, and we will be happy to answer uh, some questions. So with that, I'm going to take a breath, have a drink of water, um, give my voice a second to catch up, and I'm going to let Daniel visit, speak for a minute. All right, well, I'm going to give you a few here that we can start answering that all kind of are, from a parent's perspective, uh, looking for resources, tools, um, and, and helps as far as how to, how to talk to their children, how to guide, protect. So let me just kind of give you some of these here. Um, how do we protect our kids um, from this and other culture challenges? How do we prepare our kids for situations where they'll be exposed to pornography, even if we've taken a lot of safeguards? Mm -hmm. um, what are basic tips that you would give to help us do that, to protect and prepare? And then when should I have this discussion with my kids? When should I start talking to them about these dangers? So in that frame, like, could you guys maybe talk about that while we're waiting for more questions? And there's some starting to come in. So sure. let's start with these. Sure. Do I dare ask one of you to go grab that Honest Talk book? Uh, and if there's anything you ladies want to share, please, I'm happy to, uh, to relinquish some time. Um, you know, one of the very direct question or answers to that question, Daniel, is for the man to do the work on himself that he needs to do to become the man he needs to be in his home, the man of God, so that then he can be confident and thank you very much, equipped to have those conversations. Now, <clears throat> if I start wandering, please let me know, okay? See, I have this gift of making a short story long. It's not a spiritual gift, but it is a gift, all right? Um, in today's culture, it is unfortunate, but we're discovering it's true. If we've worked with Covenant Eyes, if you're not familiar with Covenant Eyes, that is a resource that we should all take advantage of. It is a software that you place on all your devices, whether it's Mac, uh, I think Android, they had some wrestling matches with, uh, but I believe those were resolved. iPhones, it's on, it's on my computer, it's on my phone. Um, it's on all of our devices home that what it does is it monitors internet activity. It also has a blocking part of the software. So any inappropriate images, whether on or offline, will be blurred out. The gentleman who helped develop that part of that software worked for the National Security Administration, the NSA. And he came to work for Covenant Eyes. Um, and it's, it's user-based in how it monitors activity. In other words, every person in a home that uses it has their unique sign-on credentials. So it doesn't matter what device, it's tracking the user, not the device, so much. That's, and that's where the report is generated from. And that report goes to a chosen accountability partner, whether every three days, every five days, or every seven days. Uh, mine comes to me and my accountability partner every five days. Uh, that's one tool for your home. Um, one of the greatest ways to help our children, because it's, as I go back to the point of it's not if they're going to be exposed to pornography. We don't even pretend that anymore. 
There was a day where we could say they, if they are. It, today, it's they're going to be. So the greatest way to deal with that is to begin having honest talk conversations with your children, age appropriate, about, human, about the human body, sexuality, what all the parts mean, how they're God's design, age appropriate. And today the recommendation is to begin having those conversations with children as young as five years old. The average exposure to pornography was age 11, and I heard that statistic. That statistic in, in new research is now down to eight. And here's how it happens for a lot of parents who wind up calling John Fort, our director of training and family services, uh, which, by the way, we are so excited. We just hired a brand new person to take over all of our family care so that John can go back to being our director of training full-time instead of wearing two full-time hats at the same time. So this, this lady is going to be a great addition to our team. Um, but it's having those conversations with your kids when they're young. Because here's what we want, is we want parents to become educated, have those conversations with their kids, so when something comes up, when your child sees something, hears something, that they're coming to you instead of Google because they feel safe to do so, because they can come to you and not fear of being judged or condemned or belittled or shamed, right? That's what parents need to do. Good, thank you. Um, another one, this one would probably be for Julie. Um, <laughs> put you on the spot here. Um, could you speak to just how, how you were able to stick with it after finding out after after so many years um can you give us just a snapshot of sure um oh, sorry. <laughs> so i'm i'm not used to to speaking i don't speak very often at all um how did i stick with it i have been a christian grew up catholic um i knew God from the time I was I was little and so part of my upbringing was um, I, I grew up on a farm and part of my upbringing was seeing God's creation so I knew and felt God God was a, a huge part of this and part of um, my my upbringing or my beliefs were that, you know, I have to have my own relationship with God. Um, and, and before I can, like it says in Matthew 7, before I can take the plank out of his, or the plank out of my eye, or the sawdust out of his eye, I need to take the plank out of my eye. You know, and this is a very hard thing for a lot of betrayed wives to, it's, it's a, I'm, I'm in the minority when it, it comes to that. Very much so. But that's how I grew up, and that's what my beliefs were and stuff like that. So I made it through for sure with my um, church family, the, the wives or the, the women of the church. Um, Dan needed to take care of his own, his own stuff with God. That was really, really important. And he knew I would be there. Um, I didn't know that he was not saved <laughs> when we were married. I believed wholeheartedly that he was a Christian. I wouldn't have married him, you know, if I didn't believe that, you know. But again, I put him on a pedestal just like the rest of the, the county did. <laughs> so, um, but it's just that reliance on God. And then part of um, making it through it was watching who he was hanging around how he was talking he was no he was it was no longer a self-centered talk it was a we talk um what else um just just witnessing the relationship that i knew he wanted with christ and and i could see him working at that so does that answer 
Yeah, so it's very Christ-centered. Very good. Um, question, someone asks that they have a family member that they know is struggling, but that family member doesn't know they know. Um, is it something they should bring up, um, or should they wait for them to say something? Um, and uh, so how would you, who, who wants to field that one? Uh, they're, look, they're looking at me. Um, I've had this come up a number of times. Um, it really comes down to lovingly confront this person. Not in the, in the last thing, how do I say this? I want to say this correctly so I don't have to backpedal. When you approach that individual who you know is struggling, but they're not wanting to talk about it, the last thing that that person needs to hear is more shame or condemnation. Because I promise you, if that's what they feel or they hear, they're going to shut down. You may not get the response you want the very first time you say something. But it could be something to the to this context to say, friend, I know you're struggling with pornography. And I want to help you because I love you. I care about you. I don't want you to be hurt anymore. I know this is not God's best for you. I love you and nothing is going to change that. I'm not ashamed of you. And I'm here to help. If you want me to point you to some people who can help you, I can do that. I look at the way Jesus approached Peter, and it's one of the examples for me. Because when Peter denied Jesus and Jesus turned and looked at him, I think the look from Christ to Peter was not how could you, was I am so sorry for you, my friend, because I know the pain you're in. If we approach that hurting, trapped, wounded, addicted person with that love and grace of Christ, you stand the greatest chance of getting a better response. But the bottom line is they still have to choose to get help. Okay. Thank you. This is a good one to reiterate. We've talked, we've we've been around this one, but I think just speaking to it directly, um, a born again Christian who is struggling with addiction to pornography, does God still love them and forgive them? Absolutely, yes. Okay. This is a question we get all the time. And you know what's underneath that? Is the condemnation from shame that says there's no way you can be calling yourself a Christian and do this. That's an attack on your identity. God never attacks our identity. And here's another example. I, we don't know what it was for Paul, but Paul shared, why do I do, in Romans 8, I believe, why do I do the things I hate and I don't do the things I want to do? He's battling with something going on in his body and mind and spirit that he hates doing that is probably sin. I don't think we have much of a stretch to believe that. If Paul could struggle with an unwanted behavior that he hates and still be called the greatest apostle that ever lived, you and I, as followers of Christ, can fight with things too, right? Because I was a born-again Christian, and for six and a half years, I was still making colossal mistakes. I didn't quit going back to pornography day one. I didn't, but I knew I was born again. And the evidence was I didn't like doing what I was doing. That's evidence of the spirit alive saying, I know, and you know this isn't good, but I'm here with you. Hopefully that answers that question. We all wrestle with stuff, but 
So hopefully that, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not, God doesn't love you when you clean your act up, right? It's God's love that empowers you yeah. to, to clean. Right, the prodigal son came home. The image of God the Father said, he's back. Hugged him in all his pig slop, kissed him and said, let's have a party. Did he clean him up first? No. So one more here, and then we'll, we got a couple that we can just address quickly to wrap up um, the, the Q&A here. What is the best way to clearly communicate, warn, uh, whether it's a group of men or women, either way, uh, what porn does to their walk with Christ? Like how, like if you're leading a group of, of men or women or teenagers, like what is, what would you say is the most effective way to communicate to them the damage that even messing with, with these things can do to their walk with Christ? My first response uh, is what that, what that addictive substance could do, because that's in a, in, a, in a real sense what pornography is. It's a substance that kills. What that will rob from someone first is who they are in Christ. That's, that's what's being harmed, ultimately. It's your identity. This is God's, God's best for you does not mean living this way. We're meant to live in freedom, not bondage. And, and it kind of goes back to that core identity because most people, eh, I don't want to generalize that. They don't feel like they can be part of God's family. Is to say, Let's take a look at really where you're hurting. And it's truly about that identity. It's attacking your worth, your value, identity. And it's not God's best for you. And, and in a sense, it's really that simple. Because if I, if I start pointing out all the mistakes they've made, you'll stop feeling guilty. You'll stop feeling ashamed. While those things are true, the greater loss is their freedom and their identity in Christ. And when that is addressed, it's like all of the rest of this begins to, okay, it's worth fighting against this. I don't know if that, if that answers a question. If you have something different theologically, bring it in. <laughs> no, I think that's, that's good. I think getting to that core, it starts to rob you of understanding that identity, right? You start to lose yeah. who you are when you do. That's good. I think that's a really good way to frame that. So a couple of questions that we got that let me just answer these quickly. Um, can we get a recording of this presentation? It will be on our website uh, tomorrow. Um, and um, I am going to ask uh, Dan if he will give me his slide deck from tonight, and I will then turn that into a PDF that we will also attach to that video so that these slides, you guys can download those and have those as well. So yes, there will be a, a recording on our website that has, that has all, of, all of this from tonight, both the, what's on the screen and the, the video of, of the presentation. Um, and then the other one was about books that you guys would recommend. Um, I know Melanie's got a table in the foyer that has some of those. We, I'll just say this, I'm going to let them speak to that for a minute, but I also want to let you know that in the coming couple of weeks, um, Garrett and, and Teresa uh, and our, our, our next-gen team will be sending out communication sure. uh, to, to our families with lists of resources, whether it's podcasts books, um, oh. resources on Right Now Media that we that we would recommend. So we're going to follow up with resources as well sure. um, to, to do that. But I'll let you guys real quickly speak to, like, books that you would say, if you, if you can only read this, this is what you need to read. Yeah. <clears throat> Melody's going to go out and grab, told you my voice is trying to leave the building. I apologize. Um, there are... All of the books out there are good. So, but if you were going to take a look at one or two books as a read to begin, um, Grace Based Transformation is Jonathan's newest book. And while this will absolutely help uh, 
any man or woman struggling with a, an unwanted sexual behavior, it will, it will walk you through all kinds of other struggles in life and just life in general. It is a, it is a well-written short read on what it looks like to walk the journey from needing healing and to grow and then what it looks like to begin to share. It's truly a discipleship path is what it is. It's a great read. For couples who maybe want to start doing something together, um, this book by Stephen Cervantes that we have out there is called 40 Days to Oneness. It's a book that's meant to be gone through with a couple together, and it'll walk you through all kinds of things, intimacy, communication, uh, and this has been a great resource for a lot of couples. So if it's a couple and you want to get a good start on some maybe some tough conversations but needed conversations, this is a great book. Um, the work or the online uh, group that I talked about, Grace Based Recovery, this book, that's exactly what this is. You go through this. Um, this is. Recovery 101 from a Christian perspective. Everything our ministry does is centered and built on the Word of God. And we approach everything from the grace-based idea. That's why it's grace-based recovery. That's why that says grace-based transformation. Right. Right. This is for any addiction. It's not uh, in this second edition. It's for any, anything people are wrestling with. It could be drugs, alcohol whatever it is, okay? Um, and then this one by Dr. Julie Slattery, God, Sex, and Marriage, fantastic read. Again, for couples or an individual. She really gets into God's design for sexuality here. I don't know if any of you recall Dr. Julie Slattery. She was with folks on the family for years on their radio show. Uh, she now has a ministry called Authentic Intimacy. Julie and her team are great friends of our ministry, and we've partnered on a lot of things together. And then uh, these kids' books that Mel has there, if you want to touch on them in a second, this book right here. Jason, if you don't have a copy of this, I want to make sure you get one. Uh, if we have an extra one, we'll give it to you tonight. It's called The Healing Church. Uh, Sam Black from Kevin and I wrote this book, and I don't know what he was thinking, but I'm in chapter one, so... Um, as far as our kids' books, uh, he held this up while go honest talk. It does encourage you to start talking to your kids at age five. That's not talking to them about sex. That's talking to them about emotions and how to handle hard things. Mm -hmm. They need to learn how to channel emotions healthy and not look for, like, try to go find a place by themselves or try to do something harmful to themselves. That's where it starts out at five. And as they get older, uh, they it turns into talking about body parts and different things. So it's age appropriate. Um, amazing. I have a nine-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 14-year-old. And they all, our book is about torn up because we're always going through it. They're really tired of me talking about all this. Uh, Father-son accountability. Um, if you have a son age 12 and up, um, this is a really good book. If you if you really just need direction, dads, if you need direction to talk to your boys about all of this, this is a great little, it's a, it's a really short little book, but it's got really good conversation starters and things for you to talk to your boys about. Um, my husband has done this with all three of our boys, and I'm not allowed to touch that book. <laughs> um, just Between Us is kind of a way to journal and to talk to each other without having to have awkward conversations and to talk back and forth very honestly. It has really good conversation start starters in here, and it's for girls or boys. Um, any age that they can really start processing things, and that's different for every kid. My 14-year-old was processing at 12. My 9-year-old was processing at 4. You know, just depends on the kid as to whether you think they can answer the questions in here at a deep level. So these are the three parent books that we have. That, that's awesome. Those are, those are really helpful and, and encouraging. Um, I want to thank Dan and the team for, for being here and for Be Broken, for, for your answering your call to ministry.
Thank you. The, the willingness to, uh, to enter into ministry and to go where the Lord calls you is an, is an incredible thing. And so I thank you for that. Uh, church family, I hope you know and realize the uh, importance of this topic and uh, that we as a church are here for you. Uh, setting aside a Wednesday evening to highlight uh, the issue as well as resources, as well as Be Broken as a local ministry, um, as well as resources for you, parents, grandparents, to begin that conversation. Uh, if you have questions and additional issues, please know that um, uh, you can reach out to us as a pastoral staff um, to help answer those questions. If we don't have the answers, we will get you those answers. If you are here tonight and you're struggling, there is hope, okay? Okay. And one of the first things to do was to reach out to a trusted friend and source and just confess, just tell them, there, because there is hope in Christ. As, as Dan's testimony and, and yours as a wife, being able to, to mend a marriage, and even these important questions that were brought in, I, I want, again, for you to realize that uh, someone here tonight asked the question, can Jesus love me when I'm in the midst of this mess, right? And the truth of that is, well, Jesus doesn't start loving you afterwards, right? <laughs> Does Jesus love Dan? Absolutely, right? But Jesus didn't start loving him afterwards. It's, it's the love of Christ that finds us in the midst of the mess that allows you to walk out. So there is hope and we as a church are committed to that. We're committed to that in men's ministry moving forward, having important conversations like this. There are men's and women's groups that meet every Wednesday night that aren't in this large setting um, that are committed to being there and having these important conversations, okay? Amen. So please know that. I'm gonna pray we're out of time, but, but please, please, please know. Uh, that we're here for you, and we want you to be able to make those important steps to find freedom. Our Heavenly Father, we love you. We love that you meet us in the midst of our mess and that you do not shy away, that you stare directly at our sin. And you said, my son has paid for that sin. There is freedom, there is forgiveness, and there's the ability to walk out. You are the bondage breaker, and we believe that. We trust that. Um, help us as a church uh, to really meet our culture in the depth of sin to be able to provide hope and healing to walk out of that um, and help us as parents and grandparents to protect and to guard and to put safe uh, guards in place uh, so that we do not allow it to, to fester underneath our home and allow the enemy yeah. to reign. And we pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Dan and his team, you guys will be out front, right? Yeah. By the, by yep. the resource Absolutely. table uh, with these resources that you can at least take a picture of uh, Thanks, man. And